Hi, so welcome to our talk. Uh, we are going to talk to you about how do you secure your entire development pipeline? And if you came to our talk last year, you might recognize this diagram. It outlines the life cycle your application goes through from developers, through a CI system, into some kind of intermediate storage for your build artifacts, which in our case, these are Docker images, so this is gonna be a registry of some form, and eventually gets deployed onto your production servers, because I mean, that's really the whole point of writing software is deploying it somewhere and having people run it. And at each of these stages, we're gonna talk about best practices and give tips on how you can secure that stage of your pipeline. So this actually comes in even before Docker, because obviously Docker isn't in the uh, business of version control systems yet. And as our example application, uh, we're gonna use the Docker Content Trust service, which is uh, the open source notary project deployed as Docker's signing infrastructure. And this is a great service to talk about security uh, with because the signing, uh, the signing servers that sit on the back end have to manage sensitive keys. They actually create keys, do signing operations, encrypt those keys, and then store them in a database. So we have this special service that we need to be extra secure. On the front line, we have metadata servers that only deal with blobs of signed JSON. They're pretty much just dumb storage. And they also have their own database to put that in. And we can look at how we build these, how we test them, and how we go about deploying them in the most secure manner. So the first step in our pipeline, developers. I don't know if you saw this article back in uh, December of 2015, uh, but Juniper Networks found that there was unauthorized code running on some of their firewalls. Now what's interesting is this code didn't get on there from some kind of remote exploit in the firewall itself. They found it during an internal code review. It actually made its way into their version control system. So the question we ask is, where did it come from? And what I wanna tell you is, we don't care. We wanna cut out the entire class of vulnerability without worrying like, you know, there's one particular way somebody can get into our version control system. That doesn't matter. Like, if you're not cutting out the entire class of vulnerability, you're always gonna be playing whack-a-mole. So what can we do to secure our version control system? Well, there are two main things. The first one just being good user authentication. You should be using multi-factor auth if it's available, and if it isn't, switch to a platform that has it. The benefit of this is that your security is no longer based on just a password. It's based on a secondary device. It's the something you know, something you have. So somebody who wants to compromise your system and get in unauthorized code at the very first hurdle can't just try and brute force passwords. Or if they get hold of a database that has password hashes, they can't look up rainbow tables. If you're actually pushing code via Git, Subversion, whatever you happen to use, make sure you're using key-based authentication. For similar reasons, if somebody wants to push code and pretend to be you, they're going to have to compromise your laptop that's holding your SSH keys. But we can go a step further again. Who in this room actually has passwords on their SSH keys? Okay, that's a pretty good number, but there's also far more people that don't. The problem with that is that if there is malicious software running on your computer, it can pretend to be you. It can push code into the version control system, and as far as the version control is concerned, it might as well be you submitting that code. So a password is the minimum level of security you should have on your SSH keys. Going a step further again, use hardware tokens. YubiKeys are a great example. You can actually generate GPG keys on your YubiKey and use that for SSH by hooking up the GPG agent to the SSH agent, uh, and then if you just pull your YubiKey out, nobody can ever SSH as you. So you have a very high degree of security based on whether you're in possession of your hardware token. And you can then use that YubiKey to also sign your commits. And signing your commits is gonna give you a higher degree of authenticity on the code. You're gonna know where it came from, you're going to know who it came from, and again, you can just pull that key and nobody can sign as you. Protecting your VCS account is very important because if someone manages to compromise your account, then no matter all, what kind of effort you want to to protect your SSH or GPG key, uh, none of that matters because they can just generate their own, upload it to GitHub, and use those to push uh, commits and to sign commits. So if you own an organization, 
you should regularly audit all members of your organization to ensure that they've been able to factor off. Better yet, um, in the settings for your organization, require that every member turn on two-factor off. This way, once they've enabled it, they can't actually turn it off. GitHub won't let them. Okay. Um, so that's how you set up your VCS. How should you set up your source code repository in the VCS? Well, in addition to your code, you should also check in a full list of your pin dependencies. And by that, I mean the exact versions of every single dependency that you require to build or test your application. Um, most language dependency tooling supports this, Golang, Python. Um, the reason you wanna do this is that so developers and CI, when they check out a commit of your code, can make a consistent build every single time. Furthermore, you want to check into source control so that if there's a vulnerability or a defect, uh, when you go through and audit your code, maybe by doing a git bisect, you can see what, exactly what caused the problem. Was it a line of code that changed or was it a dependency version that got bumped or deprecated? Even better than pinning the versions of your dependencies, uh, you should pin by checksum because that guarantees the integrity of the dependencies that you install or vendor. Checksums uh, can help prevent malicious um, upstream dependencies from making it into your source control. And if you vendor in your dependencies like uh, a lot of Go repos do, you can validate that only the dependency that you specifically wanted gets in rather than whatever latest version got vendored in or got checked into your upstream uh, dependency source control. So use uh, checksums if your dependency tooling supports it. You can also download packages remotely and manually check them if you're really paranoid and your dependency tooling does not support checksums. If you do require that your developer sign your commits, you should encourage them to um, register their GPG keys with GitHub. That way you can rely on the GitHub API to let you know whether a commit was signed with a valid key or not. If you don't actually trust GitHub to tell you what a valid signing key is, because maybe one of your developer's accounts is compromised, you might wanna keep a list of trusted keys and maintain your own PKI for validation during CI step instead. So, We've secured our version control system. What are we gonna do with our CI? Well, CI should be treated like an island. There's no implicit trust. Even if you have some hard shell and a tightly controlled set of servers running within it, and your VCS is one of those and your CI is another, there should be no implicit trust between the CI and the version control system. Every piece of data that comes into your CI system needs to be verified on ingress. So if that's commit signatures, checksums of your dependencies, and if you're using some kind of dependency cache, so Go comes with all of the dependencies vended in in most projects, you still want to verify those files are correct. You shouldn't just trust that the person who committed the source code didn't tamper with the dependencies. If you don't have checksums, use signatures. The downside of signatures versus checksums is that somebody can potentially serve you an older, out-of-date piece of data. But you should also enable Docker Content Trust because we're building Docker images here. And Docker Content Trust is built on top of something called the Update Framework that specifically handles problems like out-of-date files. We have also vetted and signed all of the official images. So you can enable this today and get trusted official images to build on top of from the Docker Hub. Your CI should also be ascetic. It needs to be minimal and it needs to be disciplined. You should absolutely build minimal Docker images using the smallest base image that is usable to you. So whether that's Alpine or BusyBox or even from scratch, st you know, start with nothing and just put in your binaries. Well, I will say it's nice to be able to get a shell inside, so BusyBox is my preference. Do not embed secret or sensitive data. It can be tempting that if your registry that you're gonna push this image to is within some kind of secured cloud, you think, oh, it's okay if there's some sensitive data in the image, nobody unprivileged is gonna be able to access it. The problem here is that you're now exposing sensitive and secret information at more points in your infrastructure. It's now gonna be in your CI, it's going to be in your registry, and it's going to eventually be on your production servers. So we're going to look later at how you can use Docker secrets, both in CI and in production, 
to have a consistent way to run your services everywhere using fixtures in your CI system while using real secrets in production. And finally, absolutely sign your own images with Docker Content Trust. Because when you go to deploy your image in production, you want guarantees saying that it was actually built by your CI system. You don't want people to deploy any old random image. This is a snippet of the Docker file that we, um, the Notary project, used to run our, our unit tests and integration tests. You always want to run your tests inside a container and install the latest version of your dependencies from scratch um, because you want a clean environment in which to run your tests. If you don't have a clean and fresh environment, then it's possible that you'll get false test negatives or false test positives from outdated dependencies, um, leftover code, leftover configuration, anything that you failed to clean up from a previous test run, and you don't want that. Um, if you're using Travis CI or Circle CI, they already offer you a fresh container for every single test run, so that's great. Um, in this case, uh, we are validating, we are installing our vendor tool and re-vendoring um, all our dependencies to make sure that no extra file was committed by accident. Um, we are also running any static analysis tools that are available for your language. Um, Lint is usually nice because it makes sure that your code is easy to read and hence easy to review and audit for defects and vulnerabilities. But more importantly, a lot of languages offer static analysis tools that do basic security checks, like um, ensure that you check for certain types of errors, or more importantly, that your SQL strings don't have any string formatting in them. That way you can help prevent SQL injection attacks uh, before you actually build your binary. So run whatever stack and analysis tools there are, along with your unit tests. Once your unit tests pass, it's time to build the final minimal image that you will eventually deploy to production. Uh, as David said, we're basing it off of a very simple, small image, Alpine in this case. We are co or copying in pre-compiled binaries that are the only binaries necessary to run your application. But as you've heard from the keynote and many sessions throughout DockerCon, uh, Docker 17.05 will support multi-stage builds. So rather than having to build your binary outside, um, you can create a build container and copy it into your final minimal container. You'll see that the last stanza of the stalker file is exactly like the previous one. It's just not copying from the host. And you can see what that nets you. The build container is 560 megabytes, which is pretty huge. You don't really want to be shipping that to the registry or to production. The final minimal image is 34 megabytes, much less attack surface, and also much more efficient to ship around. So you want to also test this image to make sure that your binaries were compiled correctly. You want to test the exact image that you're going to be running in production. You shouldn't be building in any like test fixtures or test um, secrets, basically, uh, into the image that you're going to run in CI. So since we deployed a production using com a, a compose file and Docker stack deploy, we will be running our integration tests the same way with a much simpler compose file that still uses secrets. Um, in this compose file, we're just injecting some uh, hard-coded text fixtures that have been checked into the repo. Um, but we are using Docker secrets to put them in. And if you'll notice, one of the secrets is the server config file. Because config files often contain sensitive data such as API keys or database passwords, they should be treated as secrets and not necessarily as a public config that can be checked into the image. So. so we built the image, we signed it, and we pushed it to our registry. What services do we have in the registry that can help us with our security posture? And the first one that I hope everyone here has heard about is Docker security scanning. For those that aren't already familiar, Docker security scanning takes your image, breaks out all of the binary components, breaks out all of the libraries statically compiled into those binary components, compares that to a database of common vulnerabilities and exposures, or CVEs, if you've seen that term, and generates for you a report that tells you exactly what CVEs currently exist in libraries in your image. The benefit of this is you can get more proactive about your security. You can find out if there are CVEs in something before you go to deploy it, or before like an audit process comes along and finds it later. And this helps make compliance easier. 
Because if you have to deal with PCI compliance, you have to go and audit your systems to make sure you don't have CVEs on them. Additionally, if you have a new CVE, Docker security scanning goes and looks at all of the metadata it generated the first time through and re-verifies if any of your images have that new CVE and will notify you. So you now don't have to spend as much time subscribing to mailing lists and looking up in the MITRE database and working out when all these new things, new CVEs are being published. We've built a mechanism that's going to do all of that for you. And you're just going to get a nice notification that says, hey, there's a new CVE. Here are all of your images that have it. You should go and update them. And frequently, those CVEs are going to come from base images that we work very hard to make sure they get updated quickly, which means by the time you see the notification, it may literally just be a case of rebuilding your image to get the updated fixed base image, which you can then deploy out using Infracit to get a rolling deploy of your systems, and you're now fixed. And this is what it looks like. When you go in and you look at the tags in your repository, you have these nice bars that show you how many vulnerabilities you have in an image. So you can see when we published the signing service at version 0.2.0, we had a vulnerability in there, and we fixed it. And 0.3.0 was uh, no longer vulnerable. But when we actually drill down and look at what the vulnerability was, we see it was SQLite. Well, we only had SQLite in there for tests, and it just happened that we had structured things not quite as well as we could have done. So this actually helped us write better code as well, because the way we fixed the vulnerability wasn't updating SQLite, it was actually fixing our code and making sure that the production code that got built into that image didn't rely on it anymore. Additionally, we keep telling you to sign things, but it's important to understand that the signed metadata for Docker Content Trust is actually separate from the images. And this gives us a lot of additional benefits that we can talk to you about for days, but that's not what this talk is. So, Docker Trusted Registry, or Docker Hub and Cloud, if you're using either of those, already come with those services, the metadata service and the signing service, required to actually run a Docker Content Trust service. So you can start signing now, and you can push that data to your Docker Trusted Registry, or to your Docker Hub or Cloud account, and this is gonna give you trust all the way from the publisher, your CI system that builds the image, out through to your production server. And it reduces the amount of trust you have to have in the middlemen. The important bit being, if anyone gets into your registry and can tamper with that information, they don't hold the cryptographic keys to re-sign the Docker Content Trust data. So you no, you no longer have to worry about the integrity of the data coming out of a notary. Sorry, coming out of a registry. And finally, going to production, this is where it all leads to the first question is, what are you deploying? And this is where all the signing data gets taken out, and we use Docker Content Trust to only deploy signed artifacts. Additionally, if you're using Docker Enterprise Edition, you can leverage signing policies, and this allows you to put hard acceptance criteria on images being deployed. So if, for example, you want to guarantee that every single image deployed was built by your CI system and checked by your QA team and then approved by your release engineers, you can create a signing policy that says at least a mem one member of all of those groups must have looked at this thing. It's the equivalent to like LGTMs in GitHub, if you guys have all seen those, except it's now cryptographically enforced. Now that I've got the image to my server, we like to talk about least privileged microservices. This is a popular concept at Docker. It means using the absolute minimum privilege set necessary when you go to run your image. And it can be very tempting that when you run something and it doesn't work and there's a permissions error, you just go, ah, I'll just add privileged. And this is a really bad thing. Bear in mind that Docker Bench runs with privileged because it needs to scan everything to generate a security report for you. Privileged is about the worst thing you can do when you run a container. What you should be doing is looking at what your application actually needs to do and just giving it those abilities. So in the case of our applications, our metadata server and our signing service, the only privileged thing it needs to do is bind to a socket, and that's represented by capnet admin. So if we went to run the service, we would drop all of the capabilities and just add back the specific one we need. And a nice thing Docker does is when you, when you modify the capabilities, it actually also goes and modifies the setcom profile. 
And if anybody's not familiar, SecComp is a tool that allows you to whitelist system calls. So when you drop all the capabilities, Docker automatically drastically reduces the whitelist of system calls that your process can make. When you then add back in, for example, CapNet Admin, the system calls required to execute those related permissions are added back into the whitelist. And my application would now be running with a very, very small set of permissions. Now, some of you might be thinking, this isn't in services yet. And you would be correct. We are working on something that makes this a lot more usable, because we recognize historically capabilities and setcom profiles have not been the most friendly way to manage permissions. Additionally, services does still apply the default Docker set comp and capabilities, so it's not running at a higher privilege than you would normally be. I also want to think about how my services communicate with each other. A lot of exploits are based on moving horizontally once I've found an exploit within a larger system. Now, if you have the hard shell, large soup of servers, somebody can take one hop to get anywhere else in your network which make, means they only have to find a very small number of vulnerabilities across your entire deployment to potentially access highly sensitive services. You should be segmenting your networks into zero trust networks, where any pair of services that need to talk to each other are in a network and nothing else is in there. So in our case, our metadata servers need to talk to their database and they are the only service that needs to talk to it. So they have a network to themselves. The signing servers, similarly, need to talk to their database and are the only service that needs to talk to it, so they're in a network. But the metadata servers and the signing servers also need to talk to each other. So we have one more network for those two to communicate. And note that you can put a service into multiple networks. So you can segment this as fine-grained as you need to be, eventually producing the cross-product of all of the services that need to talk to each other. You should also think about how sensitive your actual workloads are. In the event there is some kind of exploit, you may want your especially sensitive services to run on their own isolated nodes. In the case of our signing service, because it's holding cryptographic keys, we, we don't want something that allows uh, a co-tenant process to be able to dump memory, because it might be able to pull private keys out of that. So you can use constraints in Swarm to limit services to specific nodes and also keep other services off those nodes. You should also use Docker secrets, because as I hope you've all seen by now, Docker secrets only sends a secret to the nodes that actually require it for running services. If a given service isn't deployed on a node, its secrets will never be deployed on that node, which again reduces the amount of sensitive data that's in any one location should it be compromised. And finally, try to deploy onto a mutable infrastructure. If you heard of the Panama Papers hack last year, this was actually executed because there was a WordPress plugin that had an unauthenticated endpoint that allowed the plugin to be updated. Anybody could shoot a zip up to that endpoint and get complete access to the host. If that had been running in a read-only container, even though the endpoint was there, even though it was unauthenticated, that exploit would not have been achievable. Now, if you absolutely must have some writable locations, you can actually mount volumes into locations that need to be writable within a read-only container. So you can use that to create very, very specific writable areas within an otherwise immutable uh, container. You should also use Docker additions for your, whatever your platform is, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, because Docker additions uses a Linux distribution built from Linux Kit, and we're attempting to make that an entirely immutable host OS. When you need to do an update, you shouldn't be patching servers. Patching servers results in inconsistencies. You're going to have one package installed somewhere, but not on another server. When you need to do an update of your base OS, you use InfraKit to do a rolling deploy and re-image every single server in your swarm. So let's have a look at a demo that's gonna to tie together all of these things we've talked about using the Docker Content Trust service. So our goal is to de deploy our final notary app in a secure way, making use of the best practices in production that David has just enumerated. So we eventually want uh, our application to be deployed across a four node swarm uh, in a configuration kind of like this, with a signer and server isolated. So let's have a look at the compose file that will do that. 
Um, here we are implementing network segregation. For every service definition, you want to assign it only to the networks that it, it absolutely needs and no more. So we have three networks. Um, the server is assigned to two. The signer will also be assigned to two. And the databases are only assigned to one each because they only need to speak with their respective services. Furthermore, we are making use of the Swarm encrypted networks feature. Um, if your services talk over mutual TLS, as our server and signer do, uh, and they're connected via, via the serve sign network, you don't need this feature because mutual TLS already guarantees you confidentiality. However, if you have services for which it's difficult or annoying to set up mutual TLS, um, you can use encrypted networks to guarantee you confidentiality. For instance, if you have a Redis cluster and you don't want to set up a S-tunnel, or if you have legacy applications that don't speak TLS. If you do rely on an external service, um, for instance, if you depend on an Amazon RDS instance, it would be a good idea to set up TLS to that instance because encrypted networks are only within a particular swarm. Um, here we are implementing uh, segregating where the nodes will be deployed by specifying deploy conditions. Um, we are setting the final s services to have two replicas each, and because the signer is sensitive, it should only go on the sensitive nodes, and the server should be segregated from those particular nodes. The sensitive nodes could have additional auditing, additional access controls, um, additional isolation. And finally, we have a similar secrets uh, segment to our previous compose file, but rather than specifying um, files that contain the secrets that will be uploaded to the swarm, we expect that the secrets already exist on the swarm. Someone on your security team or your ops team should have generated these and added them to the swarm using Docker secret create. And you don't actually know, need to know what the values are. Um, you just need to say, my services depend on these values. They have to be there. So let's have a look at how all this will work um, in action. Oops. Everything's fine. Demo gods, right? No short. Um, OK, so this is an example a CI server set up to build Notary. Um, it's just running some dummy tests. So let's have a look at the output of the last successful run and see what it's actually doing. And I need to re-log in. OK, so when you start a job, you should always enable Docker Content Trust. Um, as David mentioned, it helps protect against any corruption on your upstream registry. But more importantly, because this is a CI server and arbitrary images are being built and tagged, and you don't really want to trust the image cache on your build server. So you want to enable content trust so you're building from an image that is known good and not from whatever image might be lying around from a previous test run. So uh, using content trust, we build our a unit test container, run unit tests, static analysis tests. When they've passed, um, we use a multi-stage Docker file to build our minimal Docker uh, server image. Um, as you can see, it's installing all the compile tools that we need to actually build the binary and ultimately copying in, into a much smaller uh, base image. We do the same thing for the signer. Um, we build it using the multi-stage Docker file. And note that the build container um, for the signer is very similar to the server. So we don't actually have to reinstall all those build dependencies. It can, uh, build containers can make use of layer caches. So once everything is successfully built, uh, we run our integration tests. They pass. Um, integration tests are also run in a container to make sure that no test residue is left behind. Once everything is good, then the CI server pushes it to the registry and also signs it using the CI key. Um, this is a single key that is assigned to our build server that it can use to attest that the images that it's pushing are built by it itself. Um, in this case, um, the key is encrypted and the password is injected via uh, Jenkins um, plugins, but the best way to do that would be to run your Jenkins slave on a swarm node and use Docker secrets to inject that particular key. I'm running locally, so it was simpler to do it this way. So once everything is built and pushed and signed, uh, we can have a look at what happens on the registry. 
Um, if you're pushing to a private repository on Docker Cloud and you've enabled Docker security scanning, as soon as you upload the images, a scan will be kicked off to make sure there are no vulnerabilities in the image you just built. Um, I did this last night because I was afraid internet would cut out, but it looks like there are no vulnerabilities in the image that the previous uh, CI ran built. So it looks like we can deploy this to production without any problem. So our production swarm cluster is a Docker Enterprise Edition. This is the control plane for that particular swarm. Um, it creates a proxy for the Docker daemon that enforces uh, RBAC and user authentication rules and any other policies that you might want uh, for your production swarm. It also has some nice UI elements to let you see all the resources on your swarm. For instance, this one has four nodes, as we've mentioned before. And all the secrets that we depend on to deploy to production are already present. So deploying should be an easy job using a stack deploy. So we just run the command line. Note that I'm not actually enabling Docker Content Trust because that's enforced on the swarm itself using the Enterprise Edition. So it's creating the necessary networks, trying to create services, and there's a problem because the, at least one of those images did not meet the required signing policy on our production swarm. But we saw that the CI server did sign those images, so let's see what's wrong. If we look at our production uh, content trust settings, we see that not only is the CI server required to sign, but someone from the security team is required to sign before this uh, swarm will allow that those images to be deployed to production. So luckily, both of us are on the security team and we happen to have our personal keys around so that we can sign and make sure that they're deployable. So um, I've already download those, downloaded those images. So as a member of the security team, I'd probably want to uh, stand up an instance of the server, run some pen tests, make sure there are no SQL injections, run SQL map, um, maybe make sure there's no XSS, and once that's all good, I can use my personal delegation key to attest that the images that I've tested are good. Anytime. So assign both the server and the signer. So once those are signed, let's try redeploying our service and see if the swarm will accept it this time. So the SQL images previously were already good, um, so they had been deployed. They're just being updated right now. The server and signer images, which did not meet the signing policy before, have now been created. So let's check out the uh, status of that particular stack. Sorry, internet has I think you need that. <laughs> okay, well, if internet has died, I will have to go to the video. Sorry about that. Hang on. Uh, where is it? Okay, so this was a video I took the last time I deployed this. You click on the stack, it shows all four services up. Um, furthermore, hang on. You can make sure that they're deployed to the exact nodes that you want them to. So one and two I've specified as our sensitive nodes. So this is one. Um, if you scroll down, you'll see that it's labeled sensitive. And the tasks that it's running are, is just the signer. Um, node four is a public node. It is not labeled sensitive. So it should be running the server and associated database. So this one is running just the server. Um, the database and the other no services are running on the other two nodes. And I think that's it. No, nope, I was going to do one more. So three is the other public node and we can verify that, yeah, the server and the database are running on the other public node. So that only leaves the signer database and the other signer server by uh, 
process of elimination, we know that it's running on the other sensitive node. And that's the full CI to production pipeline uh, using Docker products. Okay, so in summary, secure your VCS systems and sign your source, pin and verify all of your dependencies, preferably using checksums, sign all of your artifacts with Docker Content Trust, leverage Docker security scanning to help you with your, the, the security of the components in your images and any compliance, deploy onto immutable infrastructure using, immu using immutable containers as much as possible, and use least privileged configurations. Thank you, and I think we have a few minutes for questions. All right, thanks guys for the talk. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for questions. I know there's a, we don't have to use all 20 minutes. Uh, there's a general session that's happening at 445 in the main expo two and three hall. Uh, but I'll start us off with a question. Sure. So I noticed that when you were signing uh, the image as one of the members of the security team, you didn't type anything into your terminal. So how did you sign that image? Um, so I had enabled Docker content push as an environment variable, and then I, sorry, Docker content trust equals one, and then I just did a Docker push. Uh, if you have content trust enabled, when you push, you will sign, and when you pull, you will verify whatever image you're trying to pull. But there was a prompt for a password, uh, mm -hmm. I assume, a password had to have been entered at that point. Yeah. Uh, did it just happen automatically? No, I typed my password in. Uh, oh, okay. It just doesn't show the little stars because on Mac OS you have like the little key icon and then it hides your typing so you can't see how many characters you type. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, uh, we have another question over there. Uh, two questions actually. Uh, the first one is around once a deployed image is out of compliance, is there a notification update at that point? Yes. Whenever, whenever a new CV is entered into the database and then it is found in one of the existing images, you get a notification. You actually get one notification that tells you all of the images that CV was found in. Okay. Uh, and slight, the sec sorry, slight clarification. The administrator of the repo yes. is notified. So if you're just using that, you won't necessarily get you. If you have nothing to do with that repository, you personally may not get notified. Okay. Actually, I'll follow on to that. Is there any way to restrict the pull once it's out of compliance? Um, we don't have any features that do that today, but that seems like it was something, it's something that could be relatively easily layered in. Okay. Um, and we're definitely looking at integrating the security scanning results into sort of the deployment aspects and swarm management side on Enterprise Edition. And the second question was around incident response. So for any SIEM integration, I'm assuming that's through logging, traditional logging at that point. Is that correct? Um, could you repeat the yeah. question? Sorry. So for security and incident response and management around that, is that through traditional logging and SIEM integration? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Is there any way that somebody utilizing the EC2 container registry um, could get some of the security, um, you know, validating images and things like that? Yeah, so the, the signing service will actually work with um, pretty much any registry. Like you can run your own beside even say Docker Hub which already has a uh, notary Docker Content Trust service. You could still run your own notary if for some reason you like really didn't want to trust the one in Hub although the keys that you're using to sign already give you all the security guarantees. So Yeah, we, we don't have a Docker Hub. We just use ECR to yeah. So um, the notary repository has instructions for running your own services, and uh, awesome. you can ping us if anything doesn't work. We'll do. Thanks. For following the gentleman, the question uh, among the list of uh, feature that you have uh, show us, which one are available through uh, open source version versus the one that required to have the universal uh, platform? Uh, um, I think signing policy yeah. was the only one that was restricted to uh, Enterprise Edition. So pretty much everything else, like Notary, we could oh. install it on the... Notary, yeah, sorry, my, my team is reminding me that uh, security scanning as well is only available in um, Enterprise Edition and Docker Cloud. So, so st stated the inverse, then what is available? Notary for signing? Yeah. 
notary, everything you saw with Swarm, constraints, secrets, uh, network isolation. Okay, thank you. So, with the uh, with the vulnerability scanning, is is there a publicly available API with that? And can we parse out things like CVE and bug track numbers if, say, we had a finicky government customer that's got their own categorization for 30, 60, 90 days for different types of vulnerabilities? I couldn't tell you. I um, mean, there is an API. I don't know if we've published yeah. documentation for it, um, but there is an API to get the results yeah. as a, in JSON. But I, yeah, I couldn't tell you exactly what they look like. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Thank there's you. nothing from that. So. As a follow on for that, is there a risk ranking for CVE? There's a, I think it's minor, major, and critical. Mm -hmm. um, because ranking CVEs kind of gives the impression that some of them aren't important. Like, I think if the security team had its way, they would just all be marked as critical. Because if you have a CVE, you should really <laughs> fix it. It should never be acceptable to say, like, ah, we don't care about that one. Uh, I guess follow on to that is that if for uh, containers you've already deployed that have been found at risk through I guess it's DCT, uh, it's just would help to prioritize which ones need to be replaced the soonest. Yes, that is on the roadmap. It is giving you essentially flagging in uh, Docker Enterprise to show we found this new CVE. These are all of the running services that are using the images that are vulnerable. That's right. Thank you. I have one it's, other it's question. On the roadmap, like the immediate roadmap. Uh, so you said earlier that we should be pitting all of our dependencies. Mm -hmm. Some dependency managing systems use a git hash uh, for a version pinning. Uh, since we've seen a git hash uh, be demonstrably, uh, we, we've, we've found a collision for git hashes. Do you recommend still pinning a dependency if git hashing is the only way to pin them? We found a collision in a very specific manufactured environment. I don't think we have to worry about it yet for general purpose Git collisions. Um, okay. Ideally, Git will get updated to a stronger hashing mechanism before it becomes something that's generally exploitable. Okay, awesome. Uh, that is, does anyone have any other questions? We still have a little bit of time. But if not, uh, thank you guys for the talk. I think it was great. Um, David and Ying did a great job. Thanks.